All right, following on from a few days ago, uh, we're going to be reacting to more bad takes by... Jonathan Poletti. Who, um, turn off the fan. Who has bad ideas about what Tolkien, J.R.R. Tolkien believed. He criminally misrepresents letter 142 to uh, Father Robert Murray, who was a close friend of J.R.R. Tolkien. He was not Tolkien's personal priest, but rather a friend. Um, quote, My dear Rob, it was wonderful to get a long letter from you this morning. I am sorry if casual words of mine have made you labor to criticize my work, but to tell you the truth, though praise or what is not quite the same thing, and better, expressions of pleasure is pleasant, I have been cheered specially by what you have said, this time and before, because you are more perceptive, especially in some directions, than anyone else, and have even revealed to me more clearly some things about my work. I think I know exactly what you mean by the order of grace, and of course by your references to Our Lady, upon which all my own small perception of beauty, both in majesty and in simplicity, is founded. The Lord of the Rings is, of course, a fundamentally religious and Catholic work, unconsciously so at first, but consciously in the revision. That is why I have not put in, or have cut out, practically all references to anything like religion, quote, unquote, to cults or practices in the imaginary world, for the religious element is absorbed into the story and the symbolism. However, that is very clumsily put, and sounds more self-important than I feel. For a matter of fact, I have consciously planned very little, and I should chiefly be grateful for having been brought up, since I was eight, in a faith that has nourished me and taught me all the little that I know, and that I owe to my mother, who clung to her conversion and died young, largely through the hardships of poverty resulting from it. Certainly I have not been nourished by English literature, in which I do not suppose I am better read than you, for the simple reason that I have never found much there in which to rest my heart or heart and head together. I was brought up in the classics, and first discovered the sensation of literary, literary pleasure in Homer. Also being a philologist, getting a large part of, my, of any aesthetic pleasure that I am capable of from the form of words, and especially from the fresh association of word form with word sense, I have always enjoyed things in a foreign language, or one so remote as to feel like it, such as Anglo-Saxon. But that is enough about me. I am afraid it is only too likely to be true, what you say about the critics and the public. I am dreading the publication, for it will be impossible not to mind what is said. I have exposed my heart to be shot at. I think the publishers are very anxious, too, and they are very keen at. Uh, they are very keen that as many people as possible should read advanced copies and form a sort of opinion before the hack critics get busy. I was sorry to hear that you are now without a cello, after having got some way, I am told, with that lovely and difficult instrument. Anyone who can play a stringed instrument seems to me a wizard worthy of deep respect. I love music, but have no aptitude for it. And the efforts spent on trying to teach me the fiddle in youth have left me only with a feeling of awe in the presence of fiddlers. Slavonic languages, for me, are almost in the same category. I have had a go, I have had a go at many tongues in my time, but I am in no ordinary sense a linguist, and the time I, spent, I once spent on trying to learn Serbian and Russian have left me with no practical results, only a strong impression of the structure and word aesthetic. Please forgive the apparent unfriendliness of type. My typing does not improve, except in speed. I am now much faster than with my laborious hand, which has to be spared as it quickly gets tired and painful. I have no doubt that you will also be hearing shortly from Edith. With much love to you, Ronald Tolkien. So that's the full, that is the full letter in its complete context. <coughs> now, can anybody, having read that, say that he was in any way trying to deflect from criticism of his work? Or trying to put this meddlesome priest to the side. Rather, it is quite clear that he was talking in confidence to a good friend. Okay, so that being said, 
<coughs> I think we left off <clears throat> uh, sort of at the end of uh, the Newman thing. Uh, it, it, another thing I think to be said about these articles is they tend to kind of jump around a little bit. In other words, there, there's like some, like there's sort of, um, it's, it's not very cohesive. He'll, he'll jump from subject to subject without really s kind of finishing out why he thought that subject was important. At least I feel that way. I, I don't know. Um, but anyway, <clears throat> so the last thing we talked about was uh, Newman uh, being an unconventional Catholic and his uh, school taking in Ronald Tolkien, John Ronald Rule Tolkien. Um, next subject. As a young adult, Tolkien all but apostatized, or uh, aposta apostatized, or he almost ceased to practice my religion, as he wrote in a later letter. But he got back on board with it, preferring Catholicism, at least, to the rival Anglican faith, which he called a pathetic and shadowy medley of half-remembered traditions and mutilated beliefs. How, could, how would he view his evangelical fans, one can only wonder. Why is this important? Yeah, I don't really know why this is important. I, evangelical Christianity, whatever you think of it, I mean, it doesn't, like, you... He was this has very little to do with whether or not Tolkien was Catholic. Exactly. This is completely... It's like, oh, he has evangelical fans, and... Um, I'm sure he has Muslim fans. What's his name? The, the Russian writer. Uh, Tolstoy. Dostoyevsky. Uh, the, the dude who wrote the Gulag Archipelago. Um... Uh, Oh, yeah. What was his name? Um, well, damn it, now I can't Solzhenitsyn? remember. Solzhenitsyn? Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, Solzhenitsyn, yeah. Uh, he had, I'm sure he has atheist fans, and he was a devout um, Russian, Russian Orthodox. Orthodox. I, so I fail to see what the perception of Tolkien by his evangelical fans has to do with much of anything. But... Um... Yeah, so anyway, um, <clears throat> uh, so then it goes on in the next uh, paragraph. But then how Catholic was Tolkien? He made no effort to study theology. Uh, many of us don't. That's not... Um, uh, he made no effort to study theology. He never visited Rome, it appeared. Why is that important? I mean, yes, a lot of Catholics do like to make pilgrimages to Rome. But that is hardly the that is hardly the center of Catholic. Okay, life. so here's the thing. It, it, this actually, I don't, this might be an intelligent sentence. I'm not sure. I For doubt it. All his disdain of mutilated beliefs. Remember, mutilated beliefs in the Anglican religion. Um, he seems to have deeply loved Santa. Uh, which. I'm not sure why that's well. I mean, okay. So, I'm going I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that Tolkien was a man who wasn't afraid of being perceived as, you know, childish. And he liked, you know, good old-fashioned bits of English stuff that might be perceived as, you know, childish or weren't or weren't Horribly theologically rooted, but are just... Another thing I would like to point out is that Tolkien was very Anglo-Saxon in his... Like, he really loved, you know, that sort of um, Dark Ages, migration period, you know, before 1000 AD kind of stuff. England in that time period. And <clears throat> while Santa, our idea of Santa is a deeply corrupted version of St. Nicholas, what he probably had, was talking about, and probably understood better than most of us, was the rather more English, traditionally English character of Father Christmas. Or, you know, I, I'm sure it had something to do with Yule back in the day, but however it works, I'm sure Tolkien knew what he was talking about, and made a distinction between St. Nicholas and Santa Claus. And... Again, I just don't see where this is a contradiction. Um, 
He okay, so he seems to have <coughs> sorry. He seems to have mostly disliked most priests. Uh, Sam, anything? Uh, I've never I've never heard about this, but all I can say is that you know, irrega- regardless of whether or not Tolkien was Catholic, that doesn't really mean. He, for example, in the Orthodox Church, I don't think I'm actually required to like every priest I ever meet. Um, you know, I, again, I just don't see how this means he wasn't Catholic. Uh, in fact, was... knowing Catholics, a lot of them, a lot of the ones that I actually know, are intensely critical. <laughs> So anyway, um, they're they're intensely critical of priests of what whatever the Vatican happens to be doing at the moment. Just they they do not pull their punches. Just as uh, in the same way that many Americans love America and seem to hate every politician. So I it doesn't that doesn't make much sense. Anyway, but to continue with this, he says um, he seems to have mostly uh, disliked most. That's a weird way to say that, I just realized. He seems to have mostly disliked most priests. He refers to the Eucharist with affection and seems to have viewed it as a meditative moment to practice compassion. Which... It is? I mean, we're talking about com- communion. Uh, and the you. I-, I mean, I can't recall off the top of my head any direct quotes, but I do know what what is being referenced here and those are you know that is a sentiment that Tolkien had again how is this non-christian christian fans uh prefer to ignore this point but tolkien's catholic advice to his grandson michael had been to go to a church that will affront your taste and be among people in states of distress he adds go to communion with them and pray for them that's and I want to point something out that I've just realized about this. So first off, that is a very good Christian sentiment. And secondly, this is directly contradictory to the assertions made earlier where he was saying that uh, that Tolkien was trying to find a church or Tolkien's mother was trying to find a church liberal enough. And again, this is just a standard Christian sentiment. Uh, There's nothing unusual about that whatsoever. uh, He continued to nurse a lot of doubts, Tolkien wrote in the same 1963 letter. The temptation to unbelief, which really means rejection of our Lord and his claims, is always there within us. Once again, that is a human thing. This, again... And that is not an admission of, of... I mean... St. Thomas the Apostle is known for what exactly? Doubting. Like, there's a, there, there's a type of person that is literally known as a doubting Thomas because of this. The point of this is, and this is, and what I don't under, like, what I don't understand what Politi is, he, he's trying to say that Tolkien is saying, look, man, I don't really know, but what a Tolkien, I would, now, I'm sure we can look this up in the letters, but what I am almost sure he is trying to say is that doubt is a natural part of humans, you know, mental process, and it is it's something we always have to be careful of. Again, this is like again, none of this is contradictory to the idea that Tolkien was Christian or Catholic. This seems directly in line with Christian Christianity and Catholicism. Um, if we are dredging J.R.R. Tolkien's unconscious for religious ideas, then his doubts would have to be noted. Uh, he wasn't sure he really believed. When he resolved he did believe, it was finally all about his mother. Though Christian fans like to think of Tolkien's religion being a set of ideas, for Tolkien it seems to have been a mode of grieving. This is incredibly... That, 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 that whole statement, which I... I know he is drawing from his interpretation of letter 142, which I just read. Cannot be, uh, that whole statement cannot be understood as anything other than bad faith. 
because if you, again, I just read letter 142. He received his initial, his, basically his initiation into Catholicism from his mother, but he held with it to the end of his life. And if not bad faith, it's at the very least, it is a very shoddy attempt to do some sort of mangled um, Freudian analysis of the situation, some sort of psychoanalysis that just is not clicking. It, it, you would have to, you have to twist your mind. The thing about it is you have to twist your mind into knots to get this, this conclusion. Um... So, uh, as Humphrey Carpenter writes, I'm, we'll have to look up this Humphrey Carpenter character at some point. Indeed, it might be said that after she died, his religion took the place in his affections that she had previously occupied. Boy, these people have some issues with their moms. Okay, uh, <laughs> but, uh, okay, but the, here's the problem with that. I could say much the same thing, that my mother was a strong source of my religious beliefs and tendencies, and that after she died, I continued in my beliefs largely due to her teachings. We, That's called being a human being with parents. We, and this is the thing. This is a very... This Nobody is, a, is unaffected by their parents and their parents' beliefs. If you... So, and that's the thing. We are... No, but none of us exist in a vacuum where we form our own ideas completely um, uh, ex nilo. It, it, it's the... We are products of our parents and our teachers and our friends. We are products of the influences around us. And we put our own spin on them, but the, I mean, at the end of the day... But to say that, like, but to say that, like, for example, that my Christianity isn't genuine because I sometimes have the human tendency to doubt or because... Uh, you know, because I've, I have asked, asked myself, is this what I really believe? So far, the answer's been yes. But, you know, I have asked myself that. Does that mean that my faith isn't real or that I don't believe? I don't think so. Um, and that's just, it's, I'm human. Humans doubt things. Nobody is ever going to be 100% certain all the time, constantly. And if you are... There might be something wrong with you, but um, to uh, 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 pull it forward here, uh, did Tolkien believe in the Bible? Well, I suppose he did. Um, Christians like a Christians like a scene. This is this was badly done. So they should be anyway. Never mind. Christians like a scene in which Tolkien led his friend C.S. Lewis into the faith. The details are odd. Tolkien said that Christianity was just like other myth systems, except for being true. A true myth, as he said. That is hardly traditional Christianity. Wait a minute. No, wait. The, although that's a... Although... Well, that is not a normal way of convincing somebody to join the faith. It is, in many ways, true. Christianity does have a lot of sort of mythic expression in it. God becomes man and tramples death by dying. You know, Christ goes into hell and uh, and brings the righteous out of hell. There is a lot of mythic symbolism in Christianity. Um, and just because you can point to another myth and go, oh, that thing's a myth, so Christianity must be a myth. Tolkien is going, no, just because Christianity is mythic does not mean it is not also actually true. Christianity is the place where the symbol and the thing symbolized are the same thing. Um, Tolkien notes in an essay, the Gospels contain a fairy story, or a story of a larger kind which embraces all the essence of fairy tale. To call... <clears throat> so, uh, that, that, sounds, that sounds a very Tolkien-esque uh, comment, and I think it's being misinterpreted as him saying that, you know... That, oh, the Gospels are just a fairy tale. I, I think it's more like if I it's if more I'm allowed like they to are the prototype almost for the ar they are the archetype yes from which fairy tales may be drawn rather than just one more fairy tale among others um, and once again that that's our view on this I'm sure if a priest was in the room I we'd get 
completely blown out of the water by a lot of this stuff. But I think the general gist of this is that none of what he is saying is is proof that Tolkien did not have a traditional belief in Catholicism, Christianity in general, Catholicism in, in particular. particular. Um, to call the Gospels a fairy story isn't what usually passes for Christian talk. Uh, there's an element in this, by the way. When we reach the end, I'm going to make it a, a sort of a thing. We have I, ten minutes. We have ten minutes. Um, so when we get to the end of this, I, I'm going to make a, sort of an assumption here about Paletti and why he's saying a lot of this stuff. And it's kind of supported by a lot of the other articles that he's written that you can kind of see, you know, in, like, the feed. But we'll get to that at the end. Tolkien was associated with the Jerusalem Bible, but did little for it except for a translate, except a translation of the short book of Jonah that wasn't really used. I don't see much feeling or int for or interest in the Bible across his entire life. Uh, I'm again, just gonna go, I'm just gonna point out that there were a lot of people involved with the Jerusalem Bible. Tolkien was one of many translators involved with the work. Right. So it's, so to say that he had no particular interest in it, the he was not the primary organizer of it. And so if the other organizers just said, "Here, here's Jonah translated. Oh, we don't pr we don't prefer your translation." Okay, and and the fact that he may not have had a passion for um, deeply understanding or um, uh, translating. The Bible is not evidence that he was not a Christian. Many people, you can, you should obviously spend your some time as a Christian, if you are a Christian, trying to understand the, um, this central work. But for the most part, that is the, tends to be the purview of priests. That's, the, these are, you know, priests, pastors, you know, ministers, yeah. whatever. These are the people... It's, it's like Paletti expects everybody who is Catholic to also be a full-fledged priest. And if you're not a... If you're a member of the laity, you can't be a Catholic in Paletti's view. So, um... The effort to claim Tolkien as a Christian writer owes to a fundamental problem. This is where... This is another section where this gets kind of funny. And it also makes... An assertion, which there, it's it's this is a fallacy. I don't, I don't want to say fallacy, but it's it's a you caught a certain <laughs> you caught a certain hiccup in my talk right there. Yeah. Just shut up about it. <laughs> um, so I don't want to say this is a fallacy, but it's a he's doing a kind of a a, a it, it's dishonest to a linguistic sleight of hand, right? Or it's not even a sleight of hand. It's it's anyway. Let me get on with it. The effort to claim Tolkien as a Christian writer owes to a fundamental problem. The religion has no fun and readable books. So it turns to writers from Tolkien to L.M. Montgomery and her Anne of Green Gables series, declaring them religiously acceptable. Montgomery wasn't even Christian. The religion's history, she'd say, was ghastly and added, I really believe the day of the church is done. The deeper problem is that the religion, uh, is that the religion works to suppress artistic talent in its own members. That would mean Christians being interested in conflict, colorful characters, ambiguity, shades of grace, sex and sexuality, and all that reads in the religion as ungodly. So this is the thing. What he's saying that is... That is just an outright lie! Well, and not only that, what he's trying to say is, because I don't believe that Christianity does anything fun or interesting, means that Tolkien can't be Christian. What he's saying, what he's saying is, I don't like Christianity. Therefore, because I like Tolkien's work, he can't be Christian. And what that, what you're doing essentially is, it, it, it's you're saying that it's 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 stupid. It's like anything. He's basically saying um, Christianity is bad. Therefore, nothing good can be Christian. Therefore, Tolkien isn't Christian. It's 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 bad logic. Well, not only is it bad logic, basically everything he said was a lie. I'm not even going to call it wrong. It's a straight-up, unmitigated lie. I mean, like, just 
just most works most most works of art most of the great architecture of Europe most of the great stories are explicitly Christian that we have access to and I'm going to I'm going to hold up my copy of Parzival by Wolfram von Eschenbach. German knight, 13th century, definitely Christian, imaginative storytelling. Or Sir Thomas, well, I'm not sure about Thomas Mallory's, um, you know, Christianity. He, I, from what I understand, he was somewhat unsavory fellow. But he was a prison. lot of the, a lot of the, yeah, he was, he was a knight imprisoned for rapt, um, and will not go into what that means here. We have five, we have four minutes left. Um, but it is an explicitly Christian story. Most people seem to think that the, that the Arthur cycle is, um, one of those, uh, one of those works that informs, you know, uh, that informs culture. So, yeah, I, I think, um, I mean, it's anyway, to put it, to and put, I, I'm going to go uh, to C.S. Lewis for a more modern example. Explicitly Christian allegory, also very fun and lighthearted. Or, and we can go to, and here's another, we can go to uh, some of G.K. Chesterton's writings, which are all very nice and effervescent and bubbly. Or you can go to, uh, you can go to, um, you know, some of the greatest classical pieces ever made. Um, you know, uh, uh, Gregorio Allegri's um, Miserere. Or, you know, you can go to... What, didn't, didn't one of them do a version of... The Divine Liturgy of St. John Chrysostom? Uh, yeah, Tchaikovsky's work. A lot of Tchaikovsky... And I know Tchaikovsky... And actually, this is kind of interesting. I know Tchaikovsky was gay. Or they say he was gay. I don't really know how... I, I, at people this point, tend to agree that he was gay. At this point, though, they say that... At the, there was a certain point in time where, where scholars basically decided that every major figure in history was a homosexual. Well, anyway... And at that we, point, I just go, okay... I can't take there any of this. There seems to be more value. evidence than not for him being gay, but it's not a really big deal. The, what I'm saying is, three minutes. These are while well, you might say, "Oh, well, they were written by other people," and, there's, and people these days love to use this word "subversive." They were secretly trying to be subversively anti-Christian. I, you know, I, if you were, in, especially in Czech, in music, if you are singing a, uh, using biblical and or you know religious texts. And it is beautiful, right? Then that is inherently, I would say, um, something to the greater glory of God. Again, almost if if the person was anti-Christian, then it is to the greater glory of God against the will of the artist. But that's neither here nor okay, there. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to actually end this video here and pick up with a new video later. So signing off. See you later.